that when two people are, quote, in love with each other, they are each turning each other on to the place in themselves where they are in love. And when two people are in love, that means they are meeting in the space of love. And what happens to us is we get hooked on our connection. It's like any junkie. And you're in love with her or with him, and you think it's the her or the him. Well, actually, the love is the state of your own being. It's just that they are in connection to open it because they love, they see you in a certain way and they allow you to see yourself in a certain way. They allow you to touch a place in yourself. Now imagine if that place is in us, what it means for somebody who is living in that place all the time. Not only with any one person, but say with everyone. You're in a bizarre predicament that everybody you look at is your beloved. Now that could be, you know, that could be a sticky wicket. Like, what are you going to do with it? When you get on a bus and you walk down a bus, do you look at it? Like, I get on a bus and you know, and there'll be a woman carrying packages and she's tired and she's had a heavy day and she's just, she's probably been cleaning somebody's house or something like that. And I'm walking back through the bus and I look at her and our eyes meet. And first, her first reaction is total paranoia. Like, what do you want from me? You gonna hustle me, rape me, mug me, steal my pocketbook, what do you got in mind? But if you don't want anything, you're just sitting right in this space. Like, here we are. And every now and then you meet somebody like this woman I'm talking about, who goes through her paranoia just like that, because there's nothing in you that makes it stick. And she comes right to the place of, but here we are. And suddenly you've got another lover. But what do you do about it? You don't rush up and say, how do you do? <laughs> you know, or you don't marry them or live with them forever after or something. You just keep walking down the bus. Because it only takes that moment to recognize another being in this space. A, a conscious being is is that space is that space is like a beloved is like a being sitting there in love with you no attachment no conditions not conditional and not I'll love you if you're this way or that way just love and it's a very incredible thing to come up with somebody towards somebody who's an unconditional lover because all of us are conditional lovers I assure you there are limits under which we will not love. We all are protecting our separateness. Now, isn't this being that I'm talking about protecting his separateness? No, because he isn't that at all. He isn't on channel seven only.
ready for the next one. Next statement is, I am not the thought of I. That is, you're not even your thinking mind. And you go through the following things. You wake up. I don't know what you go through, but I usually go through. I gotta go to the bathroom. Oh, it's warm in here. I can wait a few more minutes. I smell coffee. What's that noise outside? Oh, I got so many things to do today. Gee, I wonder if that toe is better. Gee, I gotta go to the bathroom. What was that dream I was just having? Etc. Etc. See. Your mind starts all day like a trip hammer. Look at this, look at that. What's that? Is that? Ooh, yes, I gotta read this, study that, think that. What the look, listen, feel, test, sense, taste, touch. Think, 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 remember, remember, plan, plan, think, remember, plan, sense, hear, see, smell, taste, feel. Right? It's roughly going, you know how fast it's going? It's going 17 trillion. Mind moments per blink of an eye. That's the rate at which the is going. Okay. And it's like a total tyranny because if so, your thoughts are so seductive, you begin to think you are them. So when you're eating, who are you at that moment? You're like the meat with pizza, which is my thing. When I'm eating pizza, I'm a pizza eater. You came to me and said, excuse me, sir, can you tell me who you are? I'm, I'm a pizza eater at that moment. That's who I am. You know? I mean, I'm totally involved in my sense experience. Most people just go from one thing to another, to another. When they're worried, they're worried. This to worry. This is anxiety. Sam depression. And Frida elation. And, you know, everybody's got their trip. You know, and everybody is totally consuming all the emotional states. They're real. They certainly are real. States are real, after all. your thought, if you can get, if you have the discipline in doing that, who am I to say, I am not this body, I am not these senses, I am not this thought, I am not the thought of I, then what's left is what you then become. Like the problem isn't destroying the body, you know, bang, boom. The problem is, is getting, getting free of being attached to the body. The problem, the problem isn't, isn't destroying thought or emotions. or emotions. Those are all part of your incarnation. They're part of, they're part of the flow. The game is to get free of being attached to them. You honor them, you take care of them, you do them. Here's this body, here's this personality, here are these emotions. There's depression, there's elation. Far out, look at all this stuff. And behind it all, here I am. Not even the thought, here I am, but here I am. Watch it. 
See, the predicament is that when you go back into that place, there's nothing that can be said about it. Because there's talk about it, so you've got to come down into the place to talk where talking is, which is at the level of thought. So we can only talk about the place, but we can't talk from it. Because well, another way of saying it here, here I is, or isness is. Isness is, this is, this is. Now, what are the qualities of a king who has extricated themselves from being caught in the particular illusion we were born into? Because everybody in this room, the quality of us on this plane is we all took a human birth on the physical plane, a physical, psychological plane, set of planes. And the reason we did this was because we had certain desires. And those desires made it necessary for us to take birth here. And we will keep taking birth here and keep staying stuck here until we awaken to our own predicament, which is what is called awaken, strangely enough. And as Gurdjieff says, you can't Once a person has started to awaken, you can no longer make believe you're asleep. You can make believe you're asleep, but you can't get back to sleep fully. Like once the process has started where you recognize what your predicament is, what you recognize what you're doing in this body and in this mind and in these emotions, you can't make believe you didn't recognize it. In other words, once you've started to awaken into the being, you can't go back to being a pure pizza eater again. You see, you sit down and you start to eat the pizza and you're and then a voice says, eating pizza. And that voice isn't saying you're bad or you're good, that's more stuff. It's just noticing. It's a place inside that's like a huge eye. It's a single eye. It's one eye that's a big witness. And it's just noticing your whole life dance. Eating pizza. Depressed. Trying to get holy. <laughs> Lecturing. Itchy. It's noticing it all. It's not attached. It's not trying to change anything. It's not trying to get you high or anything. It's just sitting in there. It's always been sitting in there. And slowly, the process is this kind of irrevocable thing that starts to happen to you where more and more you develop this place in you which is just sitting, noticing how it all is. You know how when you had a game you played as a child and then you get some old and the game loses its savor? And you play it with a kid, and the kid gets completely lost in it, but you're just sort of sitting playing it. Well, that's sort of what starts to happen in life. You go on doing it alone. But you're sort of sitting behind it. They talk about the candle being put in a niche in the heart, where the winds of desire no longer make the flame flicker. Which is both horrible and beautiful. Because to the extent that you have a romantic model of yourself and the world that you are trying to retain, this is hell. Because a romantic wants to keep the... And the... Mm, and the oh, don't you? You want a few more rushes out of life? What happens if every pizza is like every other one? And it's all beautiful or horrible or everything, and it's all here, and here we are, behind it all, just right you here, and I'm being far out the It's called the horrible beauty. Horrible beauty. Now, there are some very far out qualities of this space of consciousness behind the thinking mind. certainly are worthy of notice. 
that there are many planes of thought, more and more subtle, that are called astral planes and causal planes. Those are all still planes of thought. But behind the thinking mind, that space, in that space, there is only one of the thing. That is, there aren't many beings because many would already be more thought, more stuff. There's only one of it. So that the far out thing is, and this is straight on as far as well as I can understand it at this point, and my experience is corroborated as well as I am developed, that if you go in yourself far enough back, not only do you and I meet if I go back in myself far enough, but there's only one of us. There's not even two of us. It's not hello, you there. It's mm, well, whatever one says to itself. It doesn't say anything to itself, actually. It doesn't know itself, because it just is. Like when you get far enough back in, you can only be, you can't know anything, because knowing already takes an object, you gotta know something. But when you go back to this one, you're just sitting in this one. Now that's pretty strange. And can you imagine the possibility that in every one of us is this one? Which in Hinduism is called the Atman. And that this one, which is like a sun, reflects from inside out through these veils and veils and veils and veils of thought and identity and concept and all this stuff, and they end up being way, way out here and you think you are, you think you are. And when you die, the only thing that will die, it turns out, is the thought you have of who you think you are. That's all it does. Isn't that bizarre? Like, you just flipped off channel 7. And you die, and now here I am on channel 5. You are always my body. What do you do this other body? You had it all along. Like when I go to India, I go to my guru and he tells me things that happened in America. Like in these in the old days, if I was sitting here and then I got on a plane and you said to me, I want to test it. Now let's say he would allow the test to happen, which instead of screwing around, which he's prone to do. But So you say, ask him how much two and two is. So I get on a plane and I go to India and I go up into the mountains and I come to this little old man and I stand in front of him and he says to me, four. <laughs> Okay. Now, how did he know that? How do you suppose he knew? He just read my mind. Let's say I wasn't even thinking. I forgot all about my assignment. I was just blown out by being at his feet. He says, four. I say, what? He says, four, four, four. I say, I don't know what you're talking about. And then a week later, I remember, oh, that's what he's talking about. So he's not reading my mind at that level. How do you explain that? Well, well, I'll, I'll, give, I'll, you I'll give you the explanation. Maybe, maybe. Walk in a little bit. So it's not... <laughs> Go back into that place behind thought. Behind all the planes of thought. Now, there is another quality about that place. It is behind time and behind space. Because those are matrices that exist on these planes where thought is. So where he is, past, present, and future, and here and there, all are. Not only all are, but he is. It is so far out that he is literally the number four in your mouth. It's the same thing that is if you experience something in your arm. You're experiencing it within what you call yourself. And all of this, the entire universe, would be within himself if there were a demarcation at all. Now, it isn't the guy in the blanket in India that is that one. You realize that? 
that's only the package on channel 7. And what happens is often you get hooked on the packages. Oh, package, I worship you. You know, your plastic is so beautiful and your labeling is so great and all your seams are wonderful. And you worship the package and you pray to it and you sing to it and you rub its feet. Oh, holy package. And after a while, you get to the recognition that that was only the package. You've just been hustled again. And that behind the packaging, Behind that next packaging, behind that next packaging, as far as you can see, you finally come to the place where when you can see it, because you can see it inside, there's only one of us. So you end up, what you were doing was worshiping yourself. That's pretty far. But it's not you as opposed to somebody else, because there's only one of it. So that what they say in India is, it turns out that God, Guru, and Self are all the same thing. So you will enter into a path in which you are a pilgrim on a path to come to God. When you finish the path, you realize that in fact there really wasn't any goal. There wasn't any path. And there wasn't any pilgrim. Now I say there wasn't any because when you enter into that one, now imagine planets, for example, two planets. There's a little one and a big one. And the little one's coming towards the big one. Now at that point, there are two. And so the little planet says, I am going towards the big one. You're going towards the one. Now let's say that this little one just goes and merges into the one. Now, Inside the one, what is it like? Is the inside of the one saying, I am one? No, inside of one, there just is. There's no one or two, there just is. Is what? Well, is nothing. Or is everything. Now the game's getting even farther. If you don't mind my taking you out a little further. Because the predicament is, and this is the predicament of Buddhism, that all form, even the one, is another illusion. And in fact, nothing ever happened at all. enter into the place, which is the placeless place, total emptiness or fullness. It's called the void, but it's not empty. It's got everything in it, but there's nothing there. And in the final image, you see that form, all of this, and all the planes, and all the thoughts, and God, and heavenly host, and the demons, and all that stuff, and emptiness and void are exactly the same thing, they're just two different sides of the same thing. So you come to the realization, and this is that was a big leap, you come to the realization that there isn't anybody doing anything. There's just this stuff happening. Stuff happening. Life being lived, stuff happening. Laws. Dharma, the law unfolding, the Tao unfolding. But nothing to really happen. None at all. So now you begin to sense what becoming enlightened is about. Because becoming enlightened literally means dying into the one which is zero. 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 Which in fact means that when you become enlightened, since you never become enlightened, since you think you're somebody, when you give up thinking you're somebody, then what's left is enlightened. That is, you can get right up to the door, but you can never go through the door. 
See, that's the terrible predicament of people that are on the spiritual path. Because they get really good, and I've gotten holier and holier and holier, and I'm nearly going to get through the door. And you get right up to the door, and they say, uh-uh, you can't go through. What do you mean I can't go through? I'm pure. I'm pure. I'm pure. I'm, pure, I'm thinking only of God. I'm holy. Yeah, but you are still you. The you. The you. The you. And there's only room for one on the other side of the door. Sorry, you've got to leave yourself behind. Well, what's the fun of going through the door? Ah, there's the rub. Well, I think I'll stay on this side of the door for a while. I'll enjoy being right next to the door, okay? And that's where most people sit for incarnation after incarnation after incarnation. Because it's so nice to be nuzzling up against the door, but still be something. Incarnation, incarnation. And you get really good at it. I mean, this isn't gross stuff. This isn't, I'm near the door. It isn't that level. I mean, like my, Aldous Huxley, very dear friend. Alan Watts, lots of friends, people I know who I admire and respect. Gerald Hurd is people with very high spiritual development. Still, all got up to the door and they stayed around because for an intellectual, the delight in knowing you know almost everything, even though it's not I always constantly know, it's just extraordinary. I mean, all this was so blown out by how clear his understanding was of the laws of the universe, because he was so little attached to anything except the delight in knowing that he was his he was practically down to one word. You know, he'd say to him, all this, look at that horseshit, and say, extraordinary. You know, and you knew that he saw in that everything. He saw the entire universe everywhere he looked. And for the person that's on a devotional trip, oh, to get so close to the beloved, can you imagine that? To get so close to love itself. But you realize if you go through the door, it's like at the moment of orgasm, there isn't any more beloved. Let's see. And you want to stay. It's like a long, it's like an extenuated foreplay. How long can you make it last? Ten lifetimes? A thousand lifetimes? Yeah. How long can you keep it going? See? Because once the orgasm occurs, that's it. There's no you, there's no me, there's no nothing. There's just... <laughs> and that was the end of that. So we're all hastening towards the place, but not too fast. Would be the way of saying it. <laughs> we want it, but we don't want what we want just yet. <laughs> But in the meantime, for most of us, there's still plenty of stuff to do before we nuzzle up to the door. Because there's still a lot of times when we really think we're on Channel 7. We're really taking our melodrama seriously. You really think your storyline's real. I've had this terrible, I got this exam tomorrow on it. <laughs> that should do it for you. It's like I can say to you, but many of you can't hear it, but I can say to you that as I sit up talking to you, the statement I am sitting up talking to you is a total lie. That's part of that which is sitting up talking to you. And if I was sitting in my camper meditating, it would be exactly the same space I would be in as sitting here talking to you. That is, it's like a movie going by, if you will. There's talking to. There's empty. And what is watching a movie is just sitting. And the interesting thing is that even the watcher is starting to disappear. Which means more and more of the time there is less and less of anything. At that point, it just becomes functional. But the body 
is going to fill in the function. And it's got a personality, and that's filling the function. And can you imagine that your personality and your body are all parts of your package, and they are who you are? See, like people say to me, uh, is therapy good? Is it useful? And I say, well, it's fine as long as your therapist doesn't think they're a therapist. Because if your therapist thinks he's a therapist or she's a therapist, then you have to be a patient. Because in the room, there's only room for two of you. I could say it even more profoundly. If your therapist thinks personality is real, watch out. Because he's going to get you thinking personality is real. And all he'll do is help you substitute one ego structure for another one. The minute you are starting to become conscious, you can work with a therapist who still thinks personality is real and use that for your body and fender repair work on your personality without buying the whole model of the, of the therapist. The answer is if the therapist thinks they're Buddha, you'll get enlightened. Or rather, if the therapist is Buddha, because Buddha doesn't think it's Buddha, Buddha just is Buddha. Which leads to a bizarre conclusion, by the way, about how people change in relation to one another, which is, I'll lay it out, although it may be hard to buy in. What you do for another human being is share your being. That's all you do. The stuff you think you are doing is just stuff you think you are doing. Now, this is a tricky one. It's like I could say all this stuff to you, but you can only hear of it that which not only you are ready to hear, but which I am saying from a certain level of my being. If I say it from a very superficial level, it won't do anybody any good. That is, what we actually sh teach or transmit to each other is our own level of evolution. All right. Welcome back, everyone. That was awesome. That was Earth Cry, uh, also known as Anthony from Papadocio. I am joined now with him. Hello, Anthony. Welcome. 
Thank you for that awesome, awesome set. That was that was a really beautiful journey that you were able to like paint together for us. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. It was very fun too. <laughs> um, so how was it? Um, you were on our last Soul Land music series with Papadocio when we launched it in the late summer, fall last year. Um, and you got to work with Ram Dass material with the whole band. How was it working on like an independent level with the same content? Well, you know, <laughs> the reason I decided to do like a more like improvised thing, that was all improvised. It was just uh, the 30 minutes straight of one of my, one of, I actually have listened to a lot of Ram Dass recently. So it was one of my favorite talks that he did. Um, and I just figured we've been doing a lot of little snippets and then we'll play a song kind of um, inspired by the little snippet. But in this one, I was like, okay, I'm going to improvise while he's talking and I want to try to like musically like wrap the music around what he's saying. And it was just kind of a more, you know, just a different approach. And Melissa did the same thing with her, with her uh, painting. She wanted to kind of like just feel his words, you know what I mean? And try to express like, while he's talking, you know, it was just like, it was something only, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense to do that all the time. But in this case, it was like, this is a really excellent opportunity because I've already had a chance to kind of have an er energetic jam. If you, if you know what I'm saying. Oh so. yeah, definitely. The Dosio set was definitely more upbeat. For those of you who didn't catch it, if you go to the Baba Ramdas page on Instagram in the IG IGTV stories, um, <clears throat> you can rewatch the whole set there and check out the Papa Dosio set. Um, so Anthony was recently on an episode of the Mind Rolling podcast on the Be Here Now Network with Raghu Marcus. And in that episode, I I heard you speaking about like that space kind of like where your music comes from. Um, and I recently found this Ram Dass quote from like 73 um, when he was interviewed on a radio show. <clears throat> and I want to read it to you because I think it's really relevant to like what you, you and Raghu spoke about. Um, so Ram Dass said, certain musicians are doing karma yoga where it's all dedicated as a service to come to God. That's the only kind of music I can listen to now. Not that it has to be any form. It could be Western classical or Indian or somebody scraping on something. It has to do with what the musician thinks they're doing. That is, I can't listen to entertainers anymore because they're playing to the world. I can only listen to musicians who are playing inward. They're listening. It's like listening to that inner sound and then they're manifesting it through their instruments. So someone else can use that as a key to go back into themselves. And where we meet is in this other level of sound where the instrument is just the vehicle and the musician knows that. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know how else to uh, improve upon that. Other than that, I mean, you can tell, you can feel it when there's potential contrivance, you know, uh, on stage. And then you can also feel it when everyone is having that yes moment when like, not only is the musician hearing something and translating it to everybody else, everybody knows that's what's supposed to happen. It all feels like it locks in and nothing feels contrived. And like that, I know what he says when he's like, I can't listen to musicians that aren't doing that. I, I know what that means because you can sometimes feel the transmission of maybe um, a more contrived, like, you know, fist pumpy kind of thing. That's not like really, you know, authentic. And then you can also feel the, the, the power of somebody that is standing in their musical authenticity, listening to something and translating it to people because it's all resonance, you know? Yeah, definitely. Later in that same talk, Ram Dass was talking about like Frank Sinatra and no shade to Frank. He's awesome. Um, but his music, he sings about love, but it's not coming from the, from the space of love. He's singing about love to people instead of like expressing love you know, through that inner, inner kind of world. And I feel like that's kind of like what, what you're able to do with your music, especially being able to improvise over Ram Dass talking about these beautiful concepts and be able to just kind of allow the music to like come forth and like pour through you and like out of you. <laughs> yeah. I, it's, I don't know. It's, it's, it all seems like it's such an overwhelming honor to have the opportunity to, to even, you know, in, in this format, be able to, to listen and try, try in some way to like, uh, express the beauty that, you know, those words can bring out. And I don't know. Um, I think that what he's trying to speak to, or what, what he's saying is that like, there is music and then there's people 
and music is there and people are there simultaneously, but people aren't necessarily generating music and music isn't necessarily making people. It's just this conversation and this translation. There's this language, this thing that's floating around and the best musicians or musicians that really, that really touch people are musicians that can hear that and translate it as best as they can, as opposed to saying, I did that. I wrote this. It's me. Everyone look at me. <laughs> you know, it's, it's there. We're just, you know, a musician is just translating that, that beauty that's just hanging out. Yeah. I love that. And that kind of makes me think about like uh sweet Malish joined you tonight mm -hmm. um, for that painting. And I feel like that's similar to like, I know I don't want to speak for her, have you speak for her, but like that process of like improvised painting and creating this thing with the music and allowing it to like come forth through. I feel like a lot of like artists and painters in that way are also translating that space, but in like a more physical form. Yeah, she knew she was, she put a circle on there. And other than that, she was just let it rip, you know. <laughs> That's awesome. What a great flow. Um uh, you were saying just in case you're like, well, what if we if we really screw up, we'll just do it again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I want to dive into, we got a couple questions from the audience. Um, someone asked, uh, who is painting and what type of paint is she using? So that was Sweet Melissa. You guys can look her up on socials. Do you know what kind of paint she was using off chance? It's acrylic. Acrylic? Beautiful. All right. And then I've got another question from John S. It says, Anthony, how has Ram Dass impacted your approach to life and creativity? Well, I read Be Here Now pretty early in my life. I remember I was living in Athens, Ohio, and I we had it, it the actually the people that sort of took me in, um, I was kind of just floating around. The people that took me in had it on their coffee table. And so it was, you know, classic, classic. <laughs> oh, no way, you know. Like hi kid needs be here now. But um I remember the the page when he's sitting on on the toilet and it says every moment is sacred. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know. He's onto something there. And like <laughs> hilarious that like that is of all the pages, the page that like really stood out to me. But I was like, yeah, yeah, wait a minute. Like we are, we're always trying to like make this like, and people are like, let's keep it sacred like right now, but not like, not five minutes from now. Like, you know, he brought a concept that I still feel like humans in general haven't really got um, that like sacredness is mm. every, all the time, or it's not. You know what I mean? It's it's not this thing where you're like, you know, this is sacred and that's not, you know, like I, I just think that if you can walk around like thinking that like, you know, the screwdriver is also sacred or nothing is, um, it's just like something that you, you can, you can take with you and it's like a gift. And then you can all of a sudden, everything that you, however you express yourself as a gift and, you know, mm. yada, yada, yada. it all, it, <laughs> it all like started pouring out. And I think like, um, I wanted to try to approach my life and the music that I make and, and, and all that with a renewed sense of trying to inject a little bit of that thought into everything I do. And it can be funny and it can be on the toilet, but it can also be like the best thing ever, you know, and it can also be a gift. So I don't know if that came through in the way, I mean, I'm uh, yet again, I, that's why I don't sing as much as I play guitar, but you know, what can yeah. I I totally get that. I feel, I feel really similar. Um, I have this, uh, this kind of notion in my head. I watched, um, the Lion King again, a couple years ago. And, uh, there's this, you know, the moment where, uh, Mufasa takes Simba up to this big rock and they look out and he says, Mufasa, or he says, Simba, um, remember everything the light touches is our kingdom. And that like hit me that day when I was watching that movie. And now every time I look outside, I try to look for like, where's the light touching? Like, how is it dancing on the leaves? How is it dancing on like this gruddy sidewalk that this like plant is miraculously growing out of? Like, how can I use the light, like physical sunlight as a way for me to remember that like infinite well of light that's inside of me, you know, like keep that connected. Yeah. It's just one of my personal tools, I guess. <laughs> yeah, the light, the, the, you know, the light touches everything. And I, th I think we really want, we want it to touch only the beautiful things. We want this beautiful things, what the light touches, but the light touches everything. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's a, that was a really advanced message because a lot of the other, I mean, you, you see this, it's, it, you see this happen a lot where you have a lot of these spiritual teachers who are focused, hyper-focused on very wonderful, beautiful things. 
But when you're focused on that, it's difficult to, to, to do as the light does, does not discriminate whatsoever. All things are, you know, all things are, you know, subject to that. Mm, yeah, definitely. And in the, uh, the great words of Wayne Coyne, uh, the sun doesn't go down. It's just an illusion caused by the world spinning round. So even if it looks dark in this moment, the sun, it's still over there. <laughs> Love it. Um, so I've got another question here from Emily S on YouTube. She said, Anthony, while you're out walking, um, while you're out walking among the natural world alone, how do you practice meditation? In what format do you allow your heart and soul to connect, to reconnect? How do you detach? Uh, the answers in the question. Um, <laughs> I think that I'm a hyper-focused individual, um, to probably a fault. Sometimes I am so stuck on like some musical idea or who knows what, um, that people talk and then I see their mouths move and I do not register because I'm like over here in the woods walking by myself or with friends and we're just being quiet. Like the cadence of my feet and the just how beautiful beautiful everything is and how easy and simple it all is and how wonderful I like to call it original design mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. it just it just resets me. And I think especially this last year being an extremely digital year, probably for everybody. Um, I've had this nice dichotomous um, relationship with walking in the, the woods. Mm. And I think that everybody should get outside more and do that more, especially alone. It's just something that, you know, you just, there's no replacement for it. Um, so yeah, the answers in the question, I just, just walking in the woods is, is it's a full reset. Mm. If it's, you know, over, three or four hours. And say. now speaking of the woods, um, you just put out recently this entire series, uh, musical album and video series, Identity Mitosis. And I can't help but think that a lot of that was inspired from your walks in the woods. I know you used a lot of videos of like clouds rolling over the Blue Ridge Mountains and things like that. I feel like like nature's like played a really big role in the expression of your art and like the inspiration behind it. Would you agree? Yeah, I think my whole my whole life, like like musical conceptual message is trying to tie in like hyper digital crazy synthesis stuff, sound design and things like that, with like the the most opposite thing, <laughs> you know, the, the the beauty of just like I, I yet again original design and like what what um what already is and. Mm. You know, and, and what's funny is that these things may seem very opposite from each other, but they meet. If you take them as far as they go, they end up becoming each other. And mm. yeah, identity mitosis is kind of that for me. Um, it's even in the word. Uh, mm. The whole message of it was that your identity, or at least the, the, the voyage that we seem to be on right now is trying to mitose, you know, like little cells. We're trying to act mm -hmm. like we're all individuals, but we're all creating this one giant body. You know what I mean? And uh, um, that's hopefully the realization or at least the message that comes through in that series. But yeah, that's kind of, that's, that's what that's about. That's really awesome. And I'm, I can't help but see myself in the, in the zoom window here and this painting I have behind me with the two cannons, that's like that balance of light and dark. And it's on this tiny planet, if you notice. So like, they're going to keep spiraling. They're going to come right back around to each other. So it's that perfect balance of light and dark, hot and cold, you know, tots vama si, like, and that too, like, I am that too. I am that too. All of this, taking it all in. That's um, cool. So uh, we've got a couple minutes here left and I wanted to see um, with COVID starting to wind down in the world, do you guys have any plans come spring to start putting on shows again? Yeah, we have our 15th anniversary show coming up um, at the, uh, in Waynesville at that, that really cool drive-in venue that we have going on. And there, there's just a lot of shows that are, getting booked and people are calling and saying, Hey, can you guys play this? Can you guys play that? So it feels, you know, if I hopefully can leave your audience with some, some happy things, the music industry is very much live and very mm -hmm. much slowly and cautiously bouncing back. And I think we always knew that it would, but there was that <laughs> moment of like, ah, what's <laughs> what are we going to go do now? Like, you know, uh, and, and uh, so, so yeah, expect to see a lot more shows coming up here 
um, not only from us, but from all your favorite artists. Like it's it's happening again, and we're overjoyed that we can continue to share in other ways. Oh, well, I'm hopeful that all I'm hopeful it all happens this year. <laughs> we all held our breath a lot last year, but hopefully this year maybe we can get back on that. All right. So before I sign off with you today, I'm gonna I've got one more question from the audience that I think I have time to read. Um, that I'm also curious about the answer for. It was Jake H. He says, "Are there ever moments during performing that surprises even you or the band?" Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> all the we, time. We meant to do those things too. <laughs> Do you guys try to like challenge each other while you're on stage a little bit? Yeah. And, and I think that even more than that, like the, the audience tries to challenge you because what you think mm. they're going to love, you know, they, they're not like whatever. And then they'll cheer for the most random thing. You're like, Oh, they like that. Okay. Well, that's what we're doing. That's what I enjoy about being an imp- 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 improvisational act because you can move with the crowd you can you all right let's not we'll talk to mike but let's not play that song tonight let's skip that one and do you know and we'll cross things out on the set list and then people will talk about it later you know like why didn't they play that you know well the reason is probably because we felt like people would react in like a different way you know and so it's it's always been fun to to kind of be uh quick on your toes in that way mm, i love it well i'm sure you're very excited to you know be able to have that feedback loop with the audience again <laughs> yeah All right. So it looks like we are out of time for this first session. Thank you so much, Anthony, for joining us on the reboot of the Soul Land Music Series to kick off our new spring season. Um, I want everyone to hang out for a minute. We'll be back in about two minutes. We're just going to do a really short break and then we'll be right back with a live set from Random Rab. So thank you again, Anthony, and I will see the rest of you momentarily.